Good morning everyone and welcome to this Cliffwalk Church online service. Just to say, Happy Father's Day. Bit strange, indoors not going out, not being at church, in the building, not going out for a meal. Um, maybe not even seeing some of your family and um but we trust in god still but just to say happy father's day to all those fathers out there let's just read from god's word we're looking at psalm 103 verse 6 to verse 13 so that's psalm 103 verse 6 to verse 13 the lord works his righteousness and justice for all the oppressed he made known his ways to Moses his deeds to the people of Israel the Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in love he will not always accuse nor will he harbour his anger forever he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with us today. Be with us wherever we are. Lord, help us to know your presence. Help us to know your strength. Help us to know your peace and your love. Lord, thank you that you have forgiven our sin. Lord, you have forgiven our sin and you have forgotten it. You have erased our sin away. You keep no record of wrongs. Lord, help us to do the same. Lord, help us to forgive other people as you forgive us. Forgive us. Lord, help us to show mercy to people as you show mercy to us. Lord, help us to be compassionate like you. Help us to be abounding in love. Lord, help us to be slow to anger. Lord, help us to treat everyone fairly. To treat every single person on this earth fairly, Lord. To respect everyone. Lord, we need your power. We know that in your name you can break every chain. Lord, so we just pray that you would break the chain of this virus, this coronavirus, that you would break it in your name. Lord, and we just pray that you would break the virus of racism in this world, that you would break racism in your name. Lord, we just thank you for being such a great father to us. You are a good, good father. And you love us so much. Lord, we ask all these things in your great name. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
Good morning, Cliff Walk Church. Today I will be reading from Luke chapter 7, verse 18 to 28. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, evil spirits, and too many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. When the messengers of John had departed, he began to preach to the multitude concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Hello everyone, nice to be with you again. Um, Today we're going to look at the ministry of John the Baptist. So let's uh, quickly turn to John chapter 1, starting at verse 19. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. And then we move on to verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptising with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. So John is asked two questions. Who are you? What do you say about yourself? Now, if somebody asked you uh, those questions, I wonder how you would answer. 
Um, and it's important, particularly as Christians in this day and age, to have clear answers and confident answers. Because if we don't, uh, our culture will answer those questions for us. Uh, it will tell us who we are. It will tell us um, what's important about us. Uh, we all know about uh, social media, uh, how important it is to a lot of people, um, how many likes they get on Facebook, uh, how many followers they have on, on YouTube. These things are important indicators of who we are in our culture. And other important indicators are what kind of clothes you wear. Do you wear designer clothes? Do you wear certain uh, brands of clothes rather than others? Do you wear uh, designer brands of fragrance? Do you associate uh, with certain people and not others? Are you in a particular line of work with a particular level of income? All of these things, our culture says, are very important indicators of who you are. But is this true? Is our importance based on our image and our possessions and our wealth? Well, clearly not from a Christian perspective. Um, but it's important to, to know who we are and who we are not um, because these forces are shaping not just how we think about ourselves, but how we feel about ourselves. And let me give you uh, an example. This is a true story of a young lady who wasn't having a particularly good day, um, had booked in advance to go to a Christian conference on the day, wasn't feeling like going, uh, but decided to go and decided to sit right at the back where she couldn't be seen. Uh, halfway through the conference, uh, the person leading the conference invited lots of people forward for prayer. Uh, and dozens of people came out, he prayed for them, um, and then he sent them back very happily. Uh, he repeated the invitation and the same happened again. So after this, he was about to announce the final song to close the conference when he stopped dead in his tracks. It was almost like he was having a conversation on stage with an invisible person. And of course, in the Christian context, he was having a conversation with God. Um, he was praying. Uh, after a little while, he faced uh, the audience, uh, stretched out his arm and pointed right at the seat where our young lady was sitting. He called her by name and said, I'd like you to come to the front. Now, I don't know how you would feel if that happened to you. Um, but in any case, uh, she came to the front and she stood there. Uh, expecting to receive something, perhaps prayer or perhaps a verse of scripture or, or something. Uh, but she stood there for a whole minute and it started to feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable. After which uh, the man said to her, that's it, you can return to your seat now. Now she didn't know whether to laugh or cry because that morning, that very morning, she had said to the Lord, Lord, I feel so unimportant. I feel so insignificant. I don't even think you could pick me out of a crowd. What a wonderful story. And it's true. I'm sure she was never the same again. So what can we learn from John the Baptist? Uh, from this chapter, John 1, and from Luke's Gospel. Well, John the Baptist was able to say, I am but also, I am not. Uh, this is a complex question and we don't have time uh, to look at it in great detail. But what I would encourage you to do is to take what we share this morning and, and have some time with the Lord uh, to stimulate your thinking and to receive personal answers for yourself from heaven. Let's start with, I am not. Do you know who you are not? As we see from uh, John chapter 1, John was absolutely clear he wasn't Elijah, he wasn't prophet, and he wasn't the Christ. In relation to how God viewed, uh, God viewed John the Baptist, he was able to say, 
very clearly and confidently, I'm none of those things. Uh, and he said it with clarity and confidence. When God looks at us, when he looks at you, when he looks at me, in what ways does he say you are not? Now, this may be a strange way of kind of approaching this, uh, this, this passage, um, but this is a particularly important question to get right when we start to doubt God uh, and start to doubt ourselves. And I want to invite you to answer this in two ways. Um, the first one is in relation to who we are as God's children. And the second way is in relation to our place in our local church. So in relation to who we are as God's children, let's have a look at Luke chapter one. And the first thing I want to say, let's read this first. Luke chapter one. And starting at verse five, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well on in years. And then verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist presumably was told this uh, version of events, so he knew that he was not an accident. He was the result of a miracle, a childless elderly couple. And secondly, he was, as the angel said, born for a purpose, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. If God told you, you are not an accident and are born for a purpose, would you be confident that that was the case? But it's true. Look at Psalm 139. Um, I particularly want to look at verse 16. Um, uh, the message paraphrases it like this. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived one day. I think that is fantastic. So like an open book, you watch me grow from conception to birth. And then everything, all of the days that were due to me, the Lord knew about them. He knows who we are um, and he has great plans for us. You're not an accident. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. So that was the first thing. John the Baptist knew he wasn't an accident. Um, he was born for a reason. Secondly, he knew he was not a disappointment or a failure. Um, in Luke chapter 7, verse 20, we see that John the Baptist had doubts about whether he had accomplished uh, his God-given goal. So he sends a couple of disciples to Jesus and to ask Jesus, are you the one to come or should we expect somebody else? And Jesus replies uh, in verse 23, um, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. In other words, John, hold your nerve. You got it right. Even though things aren't looking great, you have completed your mission. And then he says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is none greater than John. So up until that point, John was the greatest man born to women. Wow, what an accolade. What a compliment. 
But then, immediately, Jesus follows that by saying that you and I, as princes and princesses of God's kingdom, are greater than even John the Baptist. That's amazing, isn't it? But it's true. How about us? Do I feel I'm a disappointment or a failure? Listen to the prophet Isaiah, speaking the words of God to a people in exile who were in effect in a huge prison camp and wondering if God could be trusted to help them. In verse uh, 1 of chapter 49, Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. So again, that whole um, thing about God seeing us before we were born and how precious we are to him. He said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will display my splendour. That is God's purpose for our lives. But I said, I have laboured to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. We can have days like that, can't we, where we doubt ourselves and we think, well, actually, what have I achieved? What have I done? But then uh, the prophet goes on to say, yet what is due to me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God. God sees our heart. He sees our motivation. He sees our effort. Yeah, we're not going to be shortchanged. We will receive the reward that is due to us. And I want you to notice there that he says, you are my servant Israel. Now, the church is the new Israel. So I think legitimately we can insert our individual names uh, where it says Israel. So in my case, it would be a you are my servant David in whom I will display my splendour. And I think that is what the Lord wants to do for each one of us. We bring any lack of, of sense of purpose or failure to God and place ourselves into his gracious hand. God says, I will display my splendour. Yeah, not I may display my splendour. Think about it. If this is the promise of the old covenant, then how much greater is the promise of the new covenant in which we are included? Uh, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And God raised us, you and me, up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order, what? That in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We are each seated with Christ, the King of Kings, in the heavenly places. That means that God has elevated you and me to the highest possible place prop possible. He's not ashamed to be associated with us. He doesn't give up on us. And God certainly doesn't write off his children. You may not quite believe this. But if we start acting as princes and princesses of the kingdom, then our feelings will eventually catch up with the truth of who we really are. Our part is to remind ourselves of just who we are and to live our lives to reflect that truth. One of the ways that God will display his splendour in us is as part of his bride, his beautiful bride, the church. So secondly, I am not in relation to my place in the church. So in order to answer this honestly, we need to have tried and failed at a few things. Knowing that we are loved and accepted by God and forever his, we can ask, who am I in relation to my local church? Now, if we say I am not in order to avoid responsibility or stay in our comfortable comfort zones, um, then we will miss out uh, and the church will miss out. It may be as simple as welcoming people on a Sunday morning. But if I'm looking for a role to make me feel good about myself, then I'm more likely to stay in my comfort zone. Whereas if I'm looking for opportunities to express my gratitude to God, 
then I'm more likely to try things that I might not be good at, but actually I find I am good at and actually enjoy. Don't ask me to do children's work or to lead worship. Um, I've tried those, I failed miserably. There are others who are just completely gifted in those areas that I'm very happy uh, for them to, to take on that role. But the only way we can answer I am not, truthfully, is if we step out in faith and try something new. You never know, God may surprise you. You may surprise yourself. But then John was able to say, I am. And note that his identity was rooted in scripture, in Isaiah 40, verse 3. In verse 23 of John chapter 1, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. And we know from Mark 9, uh, verse 13, that Jesus confirmed John's identity and role in, in God's purposes. He says, I tell you, Elijah has come and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it was written about him. What is God calling you to? If you're not sure, then try a few things and give God and those who know you best time to help you discover what part you can play in the Bride of Christ. Um, a good indication or a good place to start might be the list of gifts in Romans 12, uh, in Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12. But it's whatever we choose, it's really important that we root our identity in what God says about us so that we find our ultimate value and worth in God's love so that we can resist uh, the negative things that the culture says about us and so that we can push through difficulties. Even John had doubts about his ministry, even in questioning whether Jesus was the Messiah, but he held fast and completed the task even though he was put to death for his faithfulness. Now, of course, most of us are not called to death, uh, to die for our faith. But what God says about us will help us through the difficult times, as it did with the young lady I mentioned earlier. Whatever uh, we decide, we must start each day saying, I will live my life as a person who is of value and of worth and importance to God. John the Baptist never lost sight of that. And because of that, he became a blessing to others, including us. So how do we conclude? Because John the Baptist knew who he was and who he wasn't, he was able to finish the task, which was to point people to the one who really mattered, Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was not much to look at. In Mark chapter 1, verse 6, we are told that his clothes consisted of camel skin and a leather belt, and he ate locusts and honey. Hardly a fashion icon or celebrity chef. We may not be much to look at, but we can all point others to the one who really matters. We may not be evangelists, but we should all have a heart for the lost, an evangelistic heart. I have a friend who, for many years, was an expert in natural history and uh, used to meet people from other countries. Uh, but he used to complain um, that nobody he knew had come to know the Lord. Last Christmas, a Chinese professor emailed him and said, uh, My family and I, for the first time in our lives, have attended a Christian church in our city. And he says this, I came to realise just how kind Christians are. Kevin showed kindness. We can all do that, can't we? I invite you to make the following song, Here I Bow, a prayer. May it sum up everything I've said and be a continued blessing to you. Amen. the throne of mercy where would I kneel but at 
this cross of grace How great the love How strong the hand that holds us Beautiful So beautiful So he scars of healing there is a son who came in grace and truth how great the love that carries us to kindness wonderful your Thank you, David, for sharing with us what God has laid on your heart. Let me just uh, remind you, today is Father's Day, and so for those of us who are fathers, uh, to each one of us, we appreciate the recognition of today for the role that we have as fathers. Uh, if this week it's your birthday, then a very happy birthday to you. This evening we meet uh, here on Facebook in Portuguese at half past six. And during the week we'll be meeting uh, on Zoom uh, in English on Wednesday evening and the women on Friday evening. And uh, in those meetings we'll be explaining 
uh, about what we're arranging and planning to do, God willing, from July onwards, when the legal position uh, and the restrictions that are on us uh, should, should be changing. So we'll start to share that information on uh, Wednesday uh, and Friday evening. So it remains to me to say, let us share together in the words of the grace. These words are words that Paul spoke, uh, wrote to the church at Corinth. I'm sure they were read out. I'm sure they were spoken by the Christians in Corinth nearly 2,000 years ago. And we just join with them as we say these words together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. May God bless you this week. In Jesus' name.